Diversity, equity, inclusion and belonging has become increasingly an important topic in, impo in leadership in recent years. Many organisations are working to create a more diverse, equitable, inclusive workplace and global and social justice movements have also put spotlight on the need for strong DEIB leadership. It's something we know our audience are really interested in. And so I'll cut the preamble and just say I'm absolutely delighted that we've got the opportunity to talk about this with Liz Ward. Liz is the Director of Programmes at Stonewall, which is Europe's biggest LGBTQ plus and human rights charity. She's an avid social justice campaigner and footballer. So Liz, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. How are you? I'm doing very well, thank you. Happy to be here. Well, it's a delight to have you here. And um, so that our audience can get to know you a bit, a little bit better, um, we've got, we set our, I guess, a little challenge, which is to uh, tell about, tell us about yourself in 60 seconds. Okay, I will give it a go. So, um, yes, my name's Liz. I'm director of programs at Stonewall. Pronouns are she and her. And I guess the most important things that anyone should ever know about me is that um, I'm a northerner, first and foremost. So I was actually born in Birmingham, which means I can also claim being a West Midlander. But I grew up in St. Helens, <laughs> which is between Liverpool and Manchester. Um, and I grew up in a, in a very working class, single parent family. And I share that because those elements of my identity are the things that really have channeled me uh, into the work that I do in the world, which is predominantly work in the charity sector. I used to be in the youth sector for a while, uh, and now I'm in the world of DNI, but specifically with a focus on LGBT inclusion. Um, second thing you should know about me is that I'm obsessed with sport, mainly football, and that I'm a Manchester United fan. Um, and I think all of those things kind of come together actually in my role at Stonewall, in which is uh, running programs that take take us all around the world to ensure that LGBTQ plus people are free to be ourselves, no matter where they live, where they go to school, where they play sport, um, where they go to work, or even how members of our community want to be buried. So it's a really special job to be able to uh, focus on EDI, but hone in on LGBT inclusion. Um, and so, yeah, I, I'm also a facilitator. Um, I uh, yeah, still am a youth worker. I feel like it's something that I can never really stop being. Um, yeah. And, uh, and yeah, I now live in London, but Northern Earth through and through. <laughs> right. So yeah, nice to see that you're flying that Northern flag. Um, well, uh, you've, uh, you've introduced Stonewall there, which is, um, something I was going to ask you about and, uh, and founded in 1989, I believe, I, uh, as I was doing my research. Um, what does it feel like to be a leader in, in that organization that leads at the front and isn't afraid to take action? Mm. It's a huge privilege, a huge privilege. It's a massive honour. Um, I feel that, you, you know, go, be, being a leader in the charity sector means that I've been very fortunate to often work in values-based roles or values-based mm. organisations. And so I've always felt a really strong sense of purpose to, to what I do. But being in this particular leadership role at Stonewall in the moment that we find ourselves in right now um, is the the almost like the most um, humbling experience. So it's an experience in which there is a legacy that is that precedes me, and there will be a legacy that I hopefully leave within this role. So is the, mm -hmm. there is this sense in the leadership team at Stonewall that um, we are just stewards of this organisation that we have to ensure continues for the next. 30 odd years. I think we're maybe 34, 33 years old now. Yeah. Um, so it's so it's so it's incredible, like so it's a, an incredible privilege in many ways. Um it's also terrifying, <laughs> genuinely. <laughs> it's um there are many times where I have to enter into that brave or courageous space in leadership. Um, not only because we are seeing an increase in hate crime for the whole LGBT keepers community at the moment where we're seeing uh, issues around identity become kind of wedged into a, a, a more political um, horizon than we've, than we've seen in the past. So that's really, really scary, if I'm being totally honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but, but the other kind of um, uh, interesting thing about my role is that Stonewall is about 83 to 86% LGBT, like the organisation itself. So I'm very proud to say that I have one of the gayest jobs at one of the gayest organisations <laughs> in the UK, maybe even in the world, um, which is wonderful. But it also means that for myself as someone who is 
part of the LGBT keepers community, you know, very out and proud lesbian. I also have a team who are very representative of that community, whilst also trying to improve the world actually yeah. for our community. And so that 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 pressure of um being all the all the attributes of good leadership that I hope to um put out into the world has this added, there's like an added importance when not only am I doing it for the benefactor, uh, be- be- beneficiaries of the organization, but also for my own team who are okay. also that community. So um, that can be, it can be a, uh, I was going to say a burden, but it's not a burden, um, but it is a very precious thing that I carry and that I hold. And so as much as it is a privilege I often find myself, you know, doing my daily affirmations and talking myself up in the mirror and <laughs> making sure that I feel uh, able to fight whatever imposter syndrome that I carry and just uh, be the leader that I want to be in the world. You know? Well, I, I would say that you are in that position are incredibly inspiring yourself. Um, I'm curious, does any, is there anybody else that inspires you in terms of being a leader in that, in that area? Yeah, I, I, this is going to sound so cheesy, but um, my my boss actually, Nancy Kelly, who's our CEO, um, she is someone that from the day I had my interview, I was totally inspired by her. So right. um, we share we share a lot of attributes around our background and being proudly Northern, proudly working class, uh, proudly lesbian, proudly women, um, which I think is really important. So you, mm. you know, seeing someone that has um, affinities to your identities that you hold, especially in a sector like the charity sector, which tends to be incredibly middle class and quite hard to break into. Um, so that's very inspiring on on that level. Um, but there's a th- there was a time actually, uh, re- uh, well, it's about a year ago now, where we were having a particularly um, difficult meeting, as meetings are when you're in a leadership team or a senior leadership team. And then um, she has two two little two little two little ones. And there was a moment in the meeting where we just decided to end the meeting and just let life happen. And that's the phrase that she used. She was like, life is happening right now. We can come back to this tomorrow. And I think having a leader who is in very close proximity to me, because it is my boss at the end of the day, Mm. but who actually chose in that moment to centre well-being and centre the wholeness of what a person is, was um, totally transformative for me. Because I think I am... in my in my career so far, I've, I've definitely worked very hard, teetered on the edge of edge of burnout, um, driven myself very hard, and and not given myself actually that that time of compassion and space for well being that I've probably needed in the past. Mm. And so to have that from a direct, um, well, from my director, but also from the CEO, was really really transformative. So I think that's uh, she's a, a huge role model for me. Um, I kind of I, I I've I've spent my life growing growing up being inspired by the the leaders of the social justice movements. So whether that is Audre Lorde, who was an essayist and poet and activist, or Angela Davis, who is um activist and you know was, was part of the uh, civil rights movement in the US. And mm. I've I've grown up looking to those people um who I who I don't know personally obviously um but that's been very inspirational for my leadership as well um but i I always think with with people who inspire you it's nice to have a mix of people that are really in your close proximity and then people that you kind of learn from from just growing up in the world so um yeah i'd say uh nancy's been a big influence on me i I really i yeah i really love that story about that kind of stopping the meeting and uh just to let as you said let life happen i think that's uh, I think we, you know, they could, that could happen a lot more, and I suppose it probably did a lot more when you know the whole world was having meetings in this sort of virtual environment. Um, mm. Like it's less less likely to happen in in I guess a, an office, but um, mm. still that sort of attitude and that agility and being able to to work like that is a is a really good trait to have. Mm. Um, so moving into like d- diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. So for sure, DEIB is is I guess, well, it's constantly evolving, isn't it? We yeah. sort of began with diversity and inclusion as a terminology, then the inclusion of equity made it DEI. Uh, and then last year, I believe belonging was added. Um, there was another term I think you used earlier on, which it was it EDI, did you say? 
Yeah. <laughs> is that yeah? So there's 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 so many different ways of kind of having different terminologies, which could could potentially mm-hmm. get a bit overwhelming, I guess. But um, what let's let's kind of focus in on belonging. What what are the benefits uh, that would you say of creating a culture of belonging, and how can leaders promote mm-hmm. that sense of belonging among, amongst their employees? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting one, isn't it? I kind of imagine these overlords of DNI or EDI being like, this year we will add a B or this year we will add an yeah, A. Yeah. Something like that. I actually just came from a meeting earlier that um, they added an A for action. And so they had a they had an acronym that was IDEA, I-D-E-A, which I thought was right. really interesting. Um, but no, b- belonging, it's, it's so important, isn't it? And I think that we've come through a period of time where maybe it's to do with the pandemic maybe it's just the the world that we're in right now where people are starting to realize that in order to create the most effective highest performing highest grossing teams organizations businesses we can no longer do it in the way that it's been done for the last hundred years. Mm. And we've, as you said, that timeline of we've seen it with DNI and then equities involved and our belongings involved. And to me, belonging feels like you could drop all the other letters and just have belonging mm. because we spend so much of our time at work at the end of the day. Most people, some people are fortunate enough um, not to, but for the majority of us, we spend the majority of our lives working in, a, in an industry or a business that um, that hopefully we're passionate about. And when you don't feel like you belong in that space, so either to do with your identity or a protected characteristic or to do with the team culture, then the reality is the majority of your life becomes pretty hard to live through. Mm. We see that in LGBTQ plus inclusion all the time. So I think it's something like one in five employees don't feel able to even come out in the workspace. And what does that look like in reality? That looks like thinking about the pronouns of your partner when you're talking about how's your weekend. We do this great activity. It's so simple where we ask uh, participants in our programs to talk about their weekend without using the pronouns of their partner. And you realize how much time and effort it takes to think mindfully about the words in which you say. So tiny things like that, but then also more um, overt um, incidences of um, you're far more likely to be um, assaulted at work if you are from a minority background or if you are part of the trans community, especially in very front facing roles like in the service industry. Um, mm. And that's and that's that's terrifying. We've got to do better than that. And I think organisations, corporates, public sector, private sector are realising that we have to do the right thing, which is centre belonging, but also that it's good for them. So when I said a minute ago about those high performing, high grossing, um, effective teams and organisations, those teams are also teams that have a fantastic culture that um, centre diversity and inclusion and equity, but also understand that staff need to feel as though they belong in order to bring uh, their selves to work or indeed bring their whole self to work. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's there's, there's an interesting piece of research that we did at Stonewall earlier this year um, around uh, Rainbow Britain. So what is the kind of state of the UK right now for LGBTQ plus communities? And what we found was, is that for the Gen Z generation, so I don't know exactly what the time period is, but people who are up to about age 23, don't kind of rest me for that, if that's (laughs) that's technically wrong. I say that as a millennial. Um, But for that Gen Z generation, it's around 46% of that generation would consider having a relationship with someone who is of uh, the same sex or gender to them. So that we're seeing this, they might still identify it as being um, straight, for, for want of a better term, but mm-hmm. also are more open-minded, are more willing, are more questioning of their identities. And that's just in one, um, that's just in kind of one vertical of LGBTQ+. We also know this generation are more likely to be supportive of Black Lives Matter or wanting more diversity in the workplaces that they want to give their skills and talents to. And so as the workforce coming in, are starting to change. The organisations that we that we are part of have to think are being forced and pushed to think. How do we ensure that belonging is is centred in all that we do? And um, and culture, workplace culture, 
plays a vital role in that. What are the values? What are the behaviours that we want to see? Um, what are we amplifying? What are, what are the consequences for? What are we not going to accept anymore? Um, and it can feel... I, I, I get the sense often when we, you know, we work with around 900 businesses on this kind of thing through LGBTQ plus inclusion, and it can feel really overwhelming of knowing what to mm. do and how to do it correctly. Um, and I really hear that. And I guess what I would offer is that it, it feels overwhelming, but you know what? So is climbing Everest and you just have to do it one step at a time. Um, and that's what we really support leaders in being able to do. Well, so what what is that starting point? Look, what does that starting point look like then? Because there might be, I guess there'll be people that are watching or listening to this going, yeah, I kind of find it. We're finding ourselves there. Where? Mm-hmm. How would you get off that starting point, that, that starting mark? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think the first thing you have to have is awareness. Awareness is so key. Yeah. Um, awareness that things could be better. Awareness that things have been fantastic and that also we still need to work on them. Awareness that even if your culture feels fantastic, culture is not a one-time thing. It is a consistent process that we go through, that we tend, that we look after, that we invest in. And so having an awareness of what exactly is going on, being able to make that diagnosis of what we're doing really, really well, what could be even better, what we want to aspire to. Um, I said this, this, the, the next, so once you've got the awareness, once you've got your mind map of what your culture is like or what your kind of belonging health record is, is looking like, the next step I would begin to diagnose where you can make those small changes. So what do you need to learn about? What do you need to think more consciously about? Um, it might be that you're fantastic on LGBT inclusion because you've been working with Stonewall's Diversity Champions for a while or something like that, but you've never really thought about access. So how do neurodiverse individuals experience your workplace? How do differently abled individuals experience your workplace? Do you have a, a, a quiet option for staff events? Do you have an alcohol free option for staff parties? You know, um, I'm beginning to make those little diagnoses about what you could improve upon. And the more understanding and awareness that you can bring to your organisation that's when you can begin to make the change because you don't know what you don't know, right? And so it's sure. about really just, uh, I often say this to organisations, which is like giving yourself the grace, the grace that you might have made a mistake, the grace that you might have messed up, the grace that you might be able to do things better and then turning that into a fierce um, action plan and passion and a fierce way forward. Um, and that's how you begin to make that change. How, how so, I mean, there are, there are lots of organisations that, maybe say that they are, are probably they're probably bigging themselves up like in terms of purpose washing so how much how much purpose washing do you think is is out there at the moment it's mm-hmm. a great question um so i think there is i think the value of the pink pound or i think it's technically the pink dollar is mm. something like 1.3 trillion dollars it's huge and so There is going to be a very real attraction to wanting to be seen to be doing the thing in order to bring in the money. We know that. I think what we're seeing now in 2023 is that consumers, clients, organisations, prospective job applicants, people are seeing through that purpose washing quite clearly. And Mm. I think big brands who have maybe been a little bit um, slapdash in the past or a little bit loose on how they've committed to LGBT inclusion or purpose inclusion, DEIB more more widely, the cracks are starting to show and and, and people are really starting to see through it. Mm-hmm. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll use an example from the, from the sporting world because I think it is just such a, such an interesting one. Is that um, and and, it, and it's slightly different because it's not quite a brand or a, or a corporate, but it is a uh, is a big organisation. So FIFA, who run football, of course, um, have lots of amazing things internally at FIFA that make them a fantastic organisation to work for in many ways. Um, but as we've seen, as they've moved through looking after big competitions or uh, putting on the World Cup or or putting on uh, big events. Um, that internal sense of we are a really welcoming organisation that understands diversity and inclusion and all of those things 
is starting to not track to the outward actions that have been displayed by the organization. And I think recently um, the, the, there was an announcement that um, an organization was going to sponsor the Women's World Cup that was in total conflict with everything that the Women's mm. World Cup really, really uh, represented. And what happened was that the the client base of, of the Women's World Cup, which is predominantly fans and also the teams and the federations, stood up and really called it out and said, wait a second, this is the Women's World Cup. It's it's happening in, uh, in Australia and New Zealand, and you're bringing on a sponsor that is in complete contradiction of the values that that we've got going for this competition. And eventually that sponsor was dropped. And I think it was just a really interesting example of how even a huge mega, mega organization that internally is doing fantastic work, Mm. um, that outward display of uh, diversity and inclusion has to track with even your partners that you bring on, your 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 new clients that you want to onboard, the people that you go into advertising campaigns with, it all has to make sense and it has to be authentic. And when it's not authentic, those cracks start to show. And I think the consumer, whoever they might be, um, are able to see through it more than ever. And um, that it's that word again, authenticity. It's really, really real and it's really important. And I think that what I have certainly seen in the organisations that I've worked with at Stonewall is that over the last, even just over the last year of working with organisations, there is a real anxiety of wanting the communication to be really clear of just how authentic this is and one thing I've really learned is that there are an army of uh, DEIB experts that are out there that are located within organizations many of whom share the characteristics and identities that they're trying to support that are absolutely passionate and uh, so desperately um, excited about um, ensuring that these brands that they may work for really communicate that authenticity. And so I think purpose washing maybe kind of five, six years ago was a huge problem. I think now brands are really, really aware that they can't get away with it as easily. Well, and I think I think organisations are, uh, there are, there are organisations that will genuinely want to make positive change. Um and they, like as you mentioned, they'll probably have, I mean, it's likely that those organizations will have individuals working for them or working in those organizations that that want that want to make those changes. So, and it might be that, well, it's highly likely that some of our audience are in that position where they're, they're identifying the need for change. They're, they're noticing mm-hmm. that within their organizations. Um, and the, but it might, they might feel that they're not, They've not got that sphere of influence within their role or within their position in their organization to make that change happen. What advice, what, well, I suppose, what can those individuals, what part can they play in promoting DEIB in the workplace? And what advice would you give them regardless of their role or position within the organization? I, I really love this question because you're so right. Like, it, and I alluded to it earlier, it can feel super overwhelming, but also mm. really disempowering if you're caught in your nine to five and you're caught in your daily tasks and you're like, how can I influence anything? I feel really disempowered to do this. Um, and what I would say to that is um, one thing we know about bad cultures is that they usually tend to be told to people top down, this is what we do, this is what we don't do, and we're not going to listen to anyone else. What we know about really good cultures and really wonderful cultures is that there's an element of collaboration in there, that there is a shared value system across the organisation, and that ultimately the people, the people of the organisation are the people who push that culture forward. So even if you are not in a role where you are able to influence policies, for example, what can you do in your own team? What can the microculture of your team Mm. be? How can that reflect the wider culture that you want for the whole organization? So I would say quite literally, I would map myself out. I would put a little stick person version of Liz or whoever you are um, and have circles, concentric circles around that stick person and work out what is in my immediate circle. So who are my immediate people that I speak to every single day in the workplace that I can begin to have an impact with? Who are their immediate people? Who are the people on the outside? And how can I begin to affect the whole organizational culture? And so actually draw it out. So that's one thing that I would say. Um, The other thing that I would say is that 
hopefully in your organisations. And if there isn't one yet, then I would think about setting one up. You should have some kind of employee networks or staff groups or employee resource groups that go cross organisationally, cross hierarchically um, and allow individuals, no matter what level they're at in the organisation, to have a really, really great impact on on what the organisation can do. And I'll share an example. There's a a law firm that we work with. We've worked with them for a long time. And they're huge, massive international law firm, got offices in every part of the world. And they have a really vibrant staff network, um, which is wonderful. The network's fantastic. And they had a young guy who joined, um, I think he joined off an apprenticeship. He was super, super young, maybe, maybe 21, maybe just straight out of uni or potentially hadn't even, hadn't even been to uni. Um, joined as a, as a, as a legal assistant, um, kind of right entry level role, um, but was a trans man. And as he was growing up and going through the healthcare that he needed, Although his big fancy law firm had fantastic private health care and lots of employee benefits, and lots of wonderful stuff, he wasn't able to get the kind of support that he needed for, for his transition. And so through the network and through uh, telling his own story, actually, and that's another thing, the power of the personal story is absolutely huge, but mm. telling his own story, he was able to eventually rally uh, the network, rally people in the organization, more senior people in the network who also became an ally to him in his identity, um, managed to get an entire policy change that not only affected the HQ down in London, but also every single office around the world. And it's transformational. It's wonderful. And I think even if you feel like you were at the bottom of the bottom rung of a very, very long ladder, you can still um, find a way of of rallying the people around you and connecting with them to make the changes that you want to make. So that's even on the big, big change level. But as, as I said, when you're kind of in your little team and you don't know what else to do, think about the influence that you have right next to you. How can you, for example, use pronouns in staff meetings or something like that? How can you actively go out in the world and ask people what they want to celebrate for Black History Month or um, Asian Heritage Month or something like that, or Diwali or any kind of event that maybe you're not part of that community? I always say allyship is about actions, right? So what are the actions that you can make in boosting that more inclusive culture? Because there's a role for everyone and cultures that are broken are cultures in which people don't feel included. So um, we all have to have that. I guess that agency and also that accountability in creating the culture that we want to see in our workplaces. And and it does take courage, doesn't it, to to get to that point. It takes courage to take that action um, yeah. in order to to kind of make that change happen. So there's, uh, and we often talk about that as as a, a leadership as as action rather than as a as a person. Mm-hmm. Um, but I suppose, or you know, if you have, if that's where change does start to happen within um the within other areas of the business perhaps not at the very top Mm -hmm. then if that and but if if the if the very top are recognize that themselves as as their that can be their own element of leadership and Mm -hmm. kind of uh, that organic organically that change should hopefully happen Mm -hmm. um and uh, yeah and then i suppose ultimately you end up with organizations that aren't that, that, that aren't just checking boxes they are they've got a, a deib culture and it's in it, in it and it's ingrained in them i guess so that's mm. uh that would be the dream i guess i suppose mm. um let's let's talk about the other passion in your life football <laughs> uh i i am not uh, fair with football i'll be honest um uh, i although i have heard of fifa and manchester yeah. united um but uh i i wanted to talk about the the football blacklist which you were named on in in 2021 for those that aren't familiar and i will include myself in that list um tell us more tell us more about that yeah it was a it was such a great moment actually so the football blacklist is a, a list of uh, individuals uh or individuals who are black or mixed race um from around the british football sphere that are just trying to improve the game basically and so it goes right from you know elite players um all the way down to uh, I guess practitioners like myself, so I was, I was uh, listed in the practitioners category, but also people in media, um, people who work for brands, people who work in, in academy setups. Um, so it was amazing. It was a real surprise. 
Um, and there were lots of people on that list that I hugely look up to. So it was a yeah, super special moment for me. Nice. And what? Well, I was going to say, what did what did making that list mean to you? And what I suppose have you? What do you think have been some of the key opportunities for as a result of that for prom- promoting diversity and inclusion in sport? Yeah. Um, so I guess my own background in football, I um, started playing, I think I was born, well, I was a C-section actually. And I think when I was taken out of my mum's uh, stomach, I think there was a football also in there. So literally, apart from the day, <laughs> not just born next to me. Um, she's, a, she's a huge Liverpool fan. So naturally, I'm a Manchester United fan because um, I've always been a bit contrary. Um, but uh, I'm obsessed with it and played it a lot. And I played to a really high level when I was a kid. And I stopped playing, um, A, because when I started high school and being a teenager, I was terrified of being called a lesbian. And that's what everyone used to call me, playing right. football. And then B, I was the only um, I was the only non-white kid on the team. Um, and so there were a few incidents that I'd had all the way through my childhood, really, but especially playing football, that were overtly racist and very definitely racist. And then also the more kind of microaggressive, quiet, uh, bubbling racisms that happened. Um, And that coupled with the with the with the lesbian thing um, meant that I walked away from football as a teenager and then never really played again. I mean, I play now at at a kind of a fun, casual level. Um, Mm. And so I have this quite full circle moment in um, in 2021 where both I was uh, delivering some workshops uh, that were related to WSL, which is the Women's Super League, so like the equivalent to the Premier League in the women's game. Um, we were delivering workshops around LGBT inclusion, and I actually managed to deliver to what was my old club when I was a kid. And so um, having that experience of going, well, I didn't, it was all online, right? So it was actually going physically back to the space, but seeing the badges and meeting the coaches and then more importantly, meeting the young women who were super excited about talking about LGBT inclusion and were really buzzing about it mm. um, and having this quite full circle moment for myself there. Um, and then in that same year, also finding out that I'd been on the football blacklist as well um, was just a kind of coming together of... Uh, I don't know, maybe quite a healing process, actually, for me personally, mm. not to get too personal, it was quite healing. Um, and then since, it's just been this really gorgeous community, actually, of, I mean, there must be a good few hundred uh, listed people now as part of that football blacklist. And um, quite regularly, they'll drop me a message and say, Liz, have you been up to anything lately? Is there anything we can promote on our socials, anything we can do? Um, and they churn out quite a consistent um drumby of uh, successes from not only me but also my um I guess my uh, listees that I was listed alongside um and other people that are just making moves in the sport and so it, it really does feel quite familial um which is really really beautiful and really really nice and mm. um and yeah it's, it's kind of like a, a network I don't know growing up as a like working class kid the idea of like a uh, knowing networks of people around in the world was something that seemed really far away from me and never something mm. that I'd be able to benefit from. And actually now I feel like I have this network of people where it's almost like we went to the same fancy university together, but we're actually just trying to make a bit of a difference in football. So, um, so yeah, so it's been really, really special. And um, I love seeing what other people do and, uh, and, and sharing, sharing that, uh, sharing their successes as well. Well, and thank you for, for sharing a, some personal stories there I did um and you've kind of already answered my next question really which was about how what the the challenges that you've maybe experienced in your life and how that's influenced your career essentially um which again you've kind of gone into has there any been any other kind of particular challenges that you've had to lead through and how how has that shaped you as a as a leader in your career yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. And I think, you know, I um, was speaking about this recently of I'm at a point in in my life now where I feel like I have these two, these two sides of myself. So one side is um, super, super authentic to the point of um, needing to, to prove myself and, and where I've come from and work really hard and run myself into the ground. So that's one side. And then the other side is um, 
code switching to the point where I feel like I no longer recognize myself. So wanting to almost be a fake version of myself. Um, and what I've kind of learned to do is really grab hold of these two demons and use them for my own um, benefit and use them for my own, um, uh, I guess, uh, protection in a way. So yeah. I like to think that I'm pretty consistent as a as a human being, no matter where you, where you find, find me on a football pitch or find me in like my living room here and I'm pretty much the same person, right? Um, but, and, and, and I really value that authenticity and I really wanted to hide that away a lot in my life of, you know, not having a stronger accent or, uh, I used to, you know, wear my hair really straight and not have um, dreadlocks. If you can't see me, I've got like, well, they're all kind of piled up on my head, but lots of uh, locks. Um, and those kinds of things where you just kind of smooth off your edges a little bit to fit into someone else's box. And I've really stopped mm. doing that. Um, but by the same token, I use that as a as a passion to to make sure that I I am really taking up space and I am thinking really, really deliberately of 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 how I present myself in in spaces that I may be less comfortable with, and you know, I'll give you an example. I um had uh, I was at a very fancy kind of corporate um event a few years ago, and I very sensibly wore black because that's what sensible people wear. They wear black. Um, and three people asked me uh, either where the toilets were or whether there's any more food coming, so they just assumed that I worked at the venue. And after that, I was like. I'm never going to wear a black suit again for any of these mm. events. And so I have a suit. I mean, people laugh at me in Stonewall because of it, but I have a suit for literally every single day of the week in a different color. Um, because I always try to make sure if I'm at a fancy event, I wear something really, really brightly colored so no one can get it twisted. No one can get it confused. And if I'm in a boardroom or something like that, or a big high stakes meeting, um, then I always try and make sure that I somehow assert myself in those first five minutes of the meeting so that people can hear my voice and hear what I've got to say. So those those are two ways that I've kind of begin to begun to develop my leadership in a way that helps me navigate the um various, I guess, injustices that that exist in society uh, through it through different identities. Um, but I think my biggest challenge that I've had to lead through, and it's still something that I think about quite often, um, what one of the hardest things you can do as a leader, is lead a team in an organisation through either a restructure or a reorganisation. Mm. And they happen so often. Um, I think when you're part of a huge organisation with thousands of people, you know, there's like a 10% cut off the top and you're so far away from it, you might not even know who those people are. Um, but the the few times in my career where I've, where I've had to be really near to that and really lead that, I've been in organisations where there's, there aren't a few thousand people. There's a maybe a hundred or so and you know mm. those individuals deeply and you know what it means for them in their lives and and their histories and and I think that I continue to um hold myself to a standard in which I can operate with integrity for myself for the team that I'm in and for the organization that I'm leading and I think that that is remains to be one of the more difficult things that I think I I have been able to do and that I'm sure other leaders listening uh, to this conversation now would agree with um in that we we have we have lived through some pretty wild years recently with, mm. the, with the pandemic and and everything else and and that puts a strain on organizations and businesses in a, in, a, in a way that is pretty unprecedented and then the human cost of that the other side um can be really, really challenging. And I think being able to, as I said, hold myself to account and remain with integrity um, is one of the hardest things that I've ever had to do as a leader. It's, it's, it's a good acknowledgement though, like that you've said that we're holding holding yourself to account is quite, quite a big deal for people, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, you know, in whatever sort of, whatever form that takes. Um, so I think that, yeah, that's a, a it's a, it's a good acknowledgement that you you've brought to light there. So if you were, if you were starting over, you're starting again, you, you've, you're, you're carrying that football as a youngster. What, <laughs> what advice, what advice would you give yourself if you're starting, starting again, starting your uh, careers again? <laughs> Such a good question. Um, first thing I'd say would be to, 
don't stop playing football because my touch now, it, it's just not as good as it used to be. Uh, so that's the first thing I'd say. Um, but no, I think it's, it's really, it's really, I was reflecting on, on, on this idea of like, what advice would I, would I give my younger self and, and what would I do? And it's, and it's really hard because I'm a firm believer in that everything happens for a reason. I know that sounds like a little bit trite sometimes, but everything that I've I've been through and that I've done in my life has, has happened for uh, for a particular reason. But I guess um, I think we 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 can allow ourselves to be um, to be dominated by that negative self talk sometimes, and I am certainly not immune to that. And I think the advice that I would give my younger self is to um, not give in to that voice of imposter syndrome that tells you that you can't do it and instill, instead um, uplift that voice that says um, maybe it's possible, just maybe it's possible and just give it a go and just see what happens. And I, I definitely have... Um, held myself back in moments that I wish I'd just gone for it and just pushed myself a little bit further forward. Um, so, yeah, so I, I would probably, I'd probably say that. I'd probably say that, but, well, you know, I, I think that, advice anyway. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's great advice. And I think, um, I think a lot of people, whether they admit it or not, will probably say the same thing. You know, there's like, I, I know I'm for one, one of those people that could just, I, I play the safe option a lot. So, um, yeah, no, I could, I could definitely be listening to that advice. Um, Liz, that brings us to the end of our, uh, time together today. So thank you ever so much for joining me. Your energy is infectious. Um, uh, and uh, your shirt is uh, amazingly well coloured. Um, uh, uh, and I immediately, as soon as you were talking about wearing the sensible option, I'm looking down at my black shirt and going, uh, okay, it's time, I'll go and change. Um, but uh, but uh, thank you um, so much for, for joining us today. Uh, and um, we've, yeah, we really appreciate you, uh, your time uh, and taking time out of your day. Um, and that just leaves me to say that if you'd like to find out any more about uh, Stonewall or if you'd like to connect to uh, with either Liz or myself on, on LinkedIn, then please just find the links uh, in the description below. Thanks ever so much for joining us today. And until the next time, take care. Hey.